did I get lost there? I was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Go ahead. That's okay. That's okay. I'm back. I'm back. Um, yeah. And, and uh, Will Seal Expansion Joints is the other line that DRE handles. Uh, so now I, uh, I have the uh, opportunity to introduce our speaker. Uh, Rebecca Best has over 20 years experience combining corporate strategy with an innovative entrepreneurial drive. The last seven years have been in the technology space, leading Marcom initiatives, creative market implementation, and the integration of sustainable data solutions within the design and construction industry. Working with international technology provider Giga, Rebecca spearheaded rapid ad adoption of the largest sustainability platform, Mindful Materials. Rebecca has extensive experience engaging with both manufacturers and AEC professionals, understanding how to create and communicate solutions to facilitate growth and engagement. Today, Rebecca leads sustainability and partnerships with Material Bank, the world's largest design materials platform facilitating the fastest, most sustainable way to search and sample materials. And I will now hand it over to Rebecca. Well, thank you, Marla. Um, okay, am I the only person that just got kicked out of the meeting or no? No, you and so did I. So I was okay. <laughs> I was like, okay. okay, perfect. Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much, Marla. Um, and that was great to make that connection right before to understand that one of your manufacturers is actually on our platform. So that's terrific. Um, I don't know, how many people do we have joining us today? Do we know? I mean, we have it on 15 of Okay, that's great. Well, hi, everyone. So um, given that my presentation is really geared towards embracing or resisting technology, um, I'm going to kind of, you know, kind of cross the lines between professional and personal and, and really kind of challenge us a little bit and hopefully test out some technology um, to see whether or not um, even this, this presentation can withstand the test of incorporating technology and does that become inspiring or do we resist it even more? Um, so before I really kind of get into what my company does and kind of how I feel like we can um, kind of bring broad change in the industry, all of us through using technology terms, and tools and, and items. I just wanted to introduce myself. So Rebecca Best, and like Marla mentioned, I'm with Material Bank, uh, focused very much on sustainability. Sustainability is a huge passion of mine, and I've been really entrenched in this kind of across all sectors um, for the past seven or eight, probably actually even 12 years, um, and partnerships as well. A really key part, what I feel when we talk about growth and technology, uh, collaborative partnerships to me are absolutely critical because as we know, I mean, even on our personal devices, like to have to bounce between all kinds of different platforms. And I think that as much as maybe people either resist or love Facebook, to be able to sign up for something with your Facebook login or with your Google login greatly facilitated the ease for us personally to be able to operate. And I really feel like bringing that kind of ease on the professional side would really help people kind of resist even any kind of blocks technology on the professional side if we can bring in some of those same kinds of tools. So as, as Marla briefly mentioned, so Material Bank um, is, is really kind of knee deep in the technology space. So we're a digital design platform. We create digital lead generation for our, for our manufacturers. Um, we drive sustainable sampling and we are a design and collab we offer design and collaboration tools to both manufacturers and firms. Um, and I'll get into kind of the nitty gritty of what we do afterwards, but I wanted to try to kick this off with a little bit of an icebreaker using Kahoot. So I'm guessing that I'm probably not the only person here with kids at school virtually that are using Kahoot in the classroom. Um, it was kind of news to me that Kahoot was also a professional tool. So the way the Kahoot's gonna work is that I am going to, um, I, I'm gonna put, let's just see if this is gonna work. Um, it's really, really simple. It's now, can you see Kahoot on my screen, Marla? Great. So Kahoot, really, you're gonna say, you're gonna go to kahoot.it and I'm going to connect this. Sorry, Rebecca, I see your Let's Play screen. Okay. Not, not the Kahoot screen. Oh, darn. How about now? Yep. Okay, so if everyone can go to kahoot.it, and if you put in this code, then we're gonna be able to start playing a little game together. <laughs> so this initial one is really just an icebreaker. Sophia, I see you're on. All right, FCJE. 
Tim, that's great. Okay, Marla, you're in there. Great. Okay. Shaman, are you going in? No, I would. I thought this. <laughs> okay. I'll wait just another couple of seconds. Cause I think that once we're all in, we're good. We're probably in and you can just leave it open. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to jump ahead. So this is really just kind of for fun. And, and really the point here is, you know, there's so many amazing opportunities to bring technology in a really great collaborative fashion to our workplace, to a presentation like this. I don't know any of you. It's great to be able to kind of just have fun and do this. Um, so I, I, I just kind of wanted to test around and play with this a little bit. So I will wait, I think, I don't know if Shaman, if you're able to just take a quick peek at the list of attendees to see, are we missing a lot of people? Cause maybe we just uh, jump ahead. No, you could go ahead and there are I'm gonna please. start. Yeah. All right, here we go. Everyone can see the screen. Okay. Okay. So this is just, you know, I mean, we can use this for anything, right? But so we've got three people that said they wanted to stay in bed. Um, we've got two people said they were darn exciting. And someone said that they felt like usual. Um, and then, sorry, if I could move my screen here, that would be great. And the last one, can anyone read where it says zero? I think nobody answered the other one. So anyway, just, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of interject with this a little bit throughout, but you know, this is just a sense for kind of how we can use Kahoot and I'm gonna you know, just kind of keep it engaging by, by doing a little bit of this here and there. So I'm going to go back to my screen. Here we go. Okay. And maybe, let's see here. And maybe you're gonna tell me afterwards, like, no, Rebecca, this is not a good situation. <laughs> we should not try to do this. Um, let's see. Okay. Sorry. Um, it seems to not be streamlining. Hmm. This is making me feel very good, Rebecca. So it's yes. not the <laughs> struggles with technology in okay. the presentation. I know my goodness. Okay. And I, I figured, let me take a risk, but let me, maybe this risk is not worth taking. So hold on why I'm not seemingly able to get back to my presentation. So if I resume share, how does that work? Oh my goodness, I'm really sorry, people. Um, okay, so I'm stopping share completely. I'm gonna start share. Let's see. Okay, so you can see, okay, so now we can back, we're back. We're on Kahoot. Okay, perfect, no, we're back here. Okay, so now, okay, now maybe, all right. Okay. Let's see. Sorry about this. Okay. So now if we look at, now I'm just going to give you a little bit of a run through on material bank, and then we're going to get into all different aspects of, um, of information sharing of let's just see here. Sorry. Okay. Information sharing technology, how we're using it. What are some trends that we've been seeing? We have a really great ability because we've got a huge number of users that are coming to our site every day. We've got the ability to be able to drop surveys in and drop polls into our members and get kind of seven or 800 A and D responding at one time. So that's a terrific opportunity for us to be able to get direct feedback. So what Material Bank really is, is the fastest, most sustainable way to search and sample materials for an architect or a designer. And on the flip side for a brand, it's really the, um, the fastest way to turn a sample into a sale. So what we've done is we've built the most powerful database of design materials. So we started very, very strong, probably 80%, 85% of our selection is really on the interior side because we're born out of Sandow Media. So you might've heard of Metropolis, interior design. So really born out of media and on the interior side. And we're rapidly growing um, with Kingspan, Belden Brick as some of our kind of marquee initial exterior products. So we're rapidly growing into architecturals and products as well. So right now we've got over 350 brand partners. And what's really interesting about the platform and one of the things from like a digital engagement perspective, we've got over 50,000 approved architects and designers. And what's really interesting here is that uh, from a technology perspective, 
it's not difficult to go and find a free platform where anybody can use the platform. It's kind of carte blanche entry. We really take pride in our vetting process and making sure that all of our users are vetted and approved so that when we're connecting them directly with our brands, they really come through as a qualified lead and a qualified source of information for that brand. So really, how does it work? So it's really one site. So again, kind of knee deep in technology. And when we launched this in January, 2019, um, the, the market seemed hungry even then for more efficiencies in workflow and streamlining workflow um, from a technology perspective. So hundreds of brands on a single site, it's one website. Architects and designers can go and order samples by midnight all of those samples get aggregated into a single box and they're delivered to a met to an architect or designer by 10 30 a.m the next day so that means that instead of trial instead of going to various websites calling various reps just to get your sample when you're working on a project that maybe you want to present the next day now you're able to come into a single space gather all of your samples have them all aggregated which obviously turns into a super sustainable initiative um, and how it works for the brands is that every time someone's ordering a sample, they understand that they're providing quality, um, quality details about the project that they're working on. And because you as a manufacturer are paying to send them a sample, it's normal that you're going to want to connect with them about that sample. So we provide daily qualified leads. We provide this exceptional client experience because now that we're talking from a digital perspective, this is just one tool where now an architect and desi our designer is able to go and greatly streamline their activity by having everything in one place when it comes to sample ordering and searching for materials. And one of the things that's interesting, and I think Shamana actually, even when we initially spoke, we hear this sometimes where maybe from a digital perspective, there's a real fear. And this isn't just for our platform, this is technology in general. And I, I wonder, you know, kind of where we look at resisting or embracing technology, is there such fear and so we resist technology because we feel like it's going to replace us or do we understand how we can leverage technology and really understand how to embrace it and how we can get so much more out of those relationships. So right. I'm going to just have you ponder on that for a quick moment, because I would guess that there might even be some people on this on this call that might think, oh, my goodness, like you're providing a sample to my client. Well, you're taking over my role. I, I don't want anything to do with that technology. What we find on the flip side is that it is such a convenience using any type of technology that if I'm an architect or designer and I'm able to connect with my product, with a sample immediately, I actually end up being really excited to speak to the rep. I actually end up being really excited for that connection that's gonna happen because I'm actually anticipating the rep reaching out to me because I know I've given project details and it was so easy and seamless and sustainable for me to actually make that connection. So it's, it's really, it's kind of interesting. And I don't, it's not until I was kind of challenged with this idea of embracing or resisting technology that I think I thought about it from that vantage point that really kind of the, the challenge that we bring to the market is how are you going to embrace technology in a way that it can help drive leads and help enhance your connections and not create a fear that by, impl by including technology in part of your sales process that somehow that's gonna hinder your process. Um, I also want to just say, because we're not a huge group, feel free at any point to jump in. If you have a question or you want clarification, um, you know, we don't need to be super formal because we're, like I said, not a huge group. Um, so that's a little bit of just the overview of how our technology works and really kind of directly from our experience, kind of that concept of embracing or resisting technology. We don't feel what, what we don't find is kind of of our 50,000 plus members, obviously there's a large portion of architects and designers that do not resist technology in any way, shape or form and want as much technology as possible to be able to streamline their workflow. So really any resistance that we see is really on the manufacturer side. And how do we, how do we as a technology industry that are providing tools to manufacturers and to their clients how do we bridge that gap to create enough education that we can inspire and excite brand partners to say, this is a tremendous opportunity for you to provide your client with ex an exceptional experience. So when we look at embracing technology, you know, we've had a tremendous amount of, of, of growth year over year. And when we launched in 2019, we were already launching like right out of the gate with month over month growth. Um, so as you can imagine with COVID hitting, um, the closure of offices, 
Um, I mean, it's no doubt that all of a sudden, whether you want as a rep or not to kind of embrace technology, all of a sudden you're left with libraries closed, no trade shows. How are you actually going to communicate with your, how are you actually going to communicate with your clients other than from a technology perspective? So if I'm a, if I'm a member, what my order cart ends up looking after I've spent five, 10, 15, 20 minutes on material bank, I now have an opportunity to have 21 items in my tray from a variety of manufacturers. And all of those items are going to be aggregated into a simple single box and sent to me the next day. Um, Can we see what that looks like? Um, of course. You mean like, do you see my screen right now? We just see the poll. Oh, you're not serious. Yep. Yes. We aren't, we aren't seeing a presentation. I thought you just left it as this. Oh my goodness. How is that possible? Here it is. You're probably like, wow, she's really into talking about stuff while we're just looking at a poll. That's right. <laughs> oh, goodness. How are you not able to see? Okay, well, what is going on here? Well, talk about figuring out how to embrace technology. My goodness. Um, why can you not see my screen? Um, so you still can't see my screen? Yeah, no, no, we can't. Oh, my goodness. So would you like me to risk doing, um, anyway, so this is, so now you can see my screen. So just so you know what I was showing before, <laughs> um, I'll just flip back through here. This was a kind of a sample of what a, what a page looks like when you're searching. Um, and then this is what a cart looks like. Um, and all of you, we don't have a gate. Material Bank doesn't have a gate. So you can go to materialbank.com. The only thing you're not able to do is order a sample. So when you actually, you can kind of see in the background here, the image of the Carnegie item where it says order sample. Everyone can see that? Yes? Yep. Great. So when you hit order sample, basically what ends up happening, and if we have time at the end, I'm happy to do a little bit of a site demo. So what happens is a box pops up where you're requested to, to submit, what is the project name? What are the project details? What stage of the project are you, are you at? And what type of project is it? So it's only once an architect or designer actually puts that information in, can your item, your sample that you're ordering actually be ordered to the, added to this cart. So this is then ultimately now that, my goodness, thank goodness you, you mentioned that. Now you can actually see what the cart looks like and then you hit send samples and this whole package of samples, except where you see Dow tile. So I guess we must be out of stock in that particular item that will come directly from the manufacturer but everything else will come directly to you in one box. So one of the reasons um, that I think also too, that there has been such a catapult, even when we launched into the industry, but then also through COVID is this intersection of personal and professional. So when we look at, you know, kind of us wanting everything now, they, on the professional side, we have found this in our focus groups, in our surveys that we do weekly with our brand, with our members, um, on the architectural and the building side of things, and just on, in most people's professional lives, because we are so accustomed to wanting everything now and expedited on our personal level, on our personal world, that is directly translated into a professional world. So we're now living in a technology world from business where people expect you to get back to them like yesterday, immediately, and they want to be able to have things at their fingertips when they want them. Um, which is clearly one of the reasons why we've been able to have such great success is because we're able to provide that and feed into that kind of everything now mentality. And so the big question here, I think, for us to look at is, you know, where there's been a lot of resistance, I think, and we've heard a lot of this trepidation in 2020 of people like, my God, I've got Zoom fatigue. I want to just meet in person. And, you know, is this actually, well, was this just simply accelerated inevitability? Because really, was this where we were going anyway? Like when we look at millennials and we look at different technologies that are out there and we look at the way we operate in our personal lives, was this accelerated kind of digitization of everything that we do? Was it going to happen anyway? And I would argue that probably it was. I just think, you know, it was kind of slapped down on us pretty darn hard without much warning through 2020. So I think that then that always leaves us with a challenge of, again, kind of back to this concept, are you just going to resist it because it didn't land on you by your choice? Or are you really going to figure out a way to embrace it? And I'm not sure about you, but I think that probably the people that have had the easiest time professionally this past year, um, if we were fortunate enough to still have our jobs, are people that I think 
actually were able to embrace it. And I think I, I kind of picked this image here for the presentation when I was thinking about this, because I was thinking when we're looking at change, you know, it's so easy just to say like, forget it, I'm resisting it, I'm not doing it. And then kind of, you know, just all coming around and maybe a lot of us are kind of still in that first phase. Maybe some people are in this second phase of technology where it's like, I know I should do it, but I really don't. And hopefully a lot of us are slowly but surely really getting to see the flexibility and the advantage and the beauty of technology and how can we really leverage it to our best benefit. So I'm not going to go back into Kahoot because I'm afraid I'll never get my screen back. <laughs> so what I will do is I'm happy to, and I don't know if you guys are willing to engage on the chat or what have you and Shamanic and moderate, or even if you just want to kind of shout out your answers. Um, I just was curious, you know, kind of if we can just go through this a little bit, like, you know, when do you expect to receive an online order? Um, like how many people do we have like that are in the two day, the under a week, same day, more than one week? Do you want to put your answer in the chat and then Shamanic can share those with us? I was just going to say, if it's not Amazon Prime, I'm like, I hate to say it, but you get that expectation, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're talking under one week. Yeah. So, I mean, is there anyone that is okay receiving an online order in over a week? Probably not. I think probably the majority of us kind of have an expectation that it's under a week or two days. Is that a fair assumption? Yep. And if it's coming the same day, we're pretty darn excited and, and kind of like, okay, well, of course you are like, let's go. Um, so I'm just, you know, kind of trying to like put us in the headspace of kind of what do we expect for ourselves on a personal level? Um, and so I'm, I'm guessing that, that we all agree that this is probably true that more people shopped online in 2020 than ever before. Um, some of the numbers that are coming out of this are, you know, more than double the number of e-commerce sales were transacted in 2020 than in, 20, in 2019. Some, some polls are showing kind of 40 to 50%, but there aren't really any polls that aren't showing an absolute significant increase in shopping online. Um, I, now, because we're not doing Kahoot, I'm telling you the answer is 22%. How does that number situate in your mind as the expected e-commerce global retail sales by 2023. Does that, does that ring true to you? Would you have thought it would be hot, lower or higher? Be a lot higher. You thought it would be a lot higher. I thought higher too. Yeah, interesting. So this is kind of the expectation. Um, I mean, higher, I guess, but I mean, can you imagine what that would mean to our, you know, kind of bricks and mortar or what have you, if like 50% was all online or, you know, kind of, you know, cause I think this is really more, this question, and maybe I'm not wording it properly, this is really about kind of e-commerce versus, you know, kind of in-person shopping. So the expectation is about 22% by 2023. So a quarter, basically a quarter of our shopping we expect. And also just to put into context here, this is really any kind of shopping. So it could be for groceries, for sporting goods, not just maybe household items or clothes or what have you. Um, again, here I'm giving away the answer because we're not in Kahoot, but groceries actually saw the highest increase in online to sales in 2020. Um, is that a surprise to anybody? No. No? So we can take a look at here. I thought this was just kind of interesting information and really more kind of from our consumer, our personal behavior. Um, so we can see, you know, these kind of numbers speak to so almost a 35% increase in supermarket and grocery sales. I was kind of surprised about sporting equipment, but I guess not given that like the Peloton and Echelon bikes have been sold out for the last eight months. Um, and with gyms being closed, people working out a lot more at home. Um, so it was kind of interesting to me to see, it's like, what did we do in 2020? We ate and we ate and we worked out or we kind of found some, some stress relief in exercise. And those were really by far the largest, um, the largest categories and then retail tech again, kind of this imposed embracing of technology was really required. So whether these were, you know, new cameras for our computers, computers in general, because maybe we had to buy new iPads or devices for home. So really kind of interesting. Is there anything here that surprises anyone or that stands out to anybody? Pretty neat to see it though, just kind of you know, what we all probably knew um, to be true, but, but I think probably interesting to see that. So, you know, question, you know, and I think that kind of we told that in the, in the poll answer is, 
you know, when we go back from a material bank, I'm putting my material bank hat on here. We know what we've seen on the professional side is that we want, you know, kind of that architects and designers are really looking for translating personal into professional. So what I would then say, you know, kind of as a discussion for us to have is really, if we want everything now, and if we have such expectations of such quick turnaround, such efficient service, why would we expect that to be any different for why our clients or why the professional world would act any differently? So that probably doesn't, um, you know, kind of leave anyone surprised to think that when we look at research and we work in very close collaboration with a group called Think Lab. So under the Sandow umbrella, Think Lab is a research arm. Um, so we have a very close partnership with them. I work a lot with them on, on kind of driving market industry research. And so it should be no surprise to anyone that because of the use of technology and especially accelerated by 2020 and the pandemic and stay at home orders and working from home, B2B sales are looking a lot more like B2C sales. And the way that we need to consider selling to B2C is to selling to B2B is very similar to how uh, a consumer brand is selling to their market and how we want to be sold to. So again, kind of leading me back to this concept of you can ask yourself the question, are you resisting or embracing technology? Um, and I think if you're resisting it, you know, you want to challenge yourself to say, so why am I resisting it? And let's kind of tackle the why and figure out how can I look to use technology in a way that can kind of meet me where I want to be met. Like maybe you're not doing Zoom calls at home on a personal level, but you're really looking to find the benefit in how you can, how you can drive business, economic success, and just professional professional contentment through, through digital tools. So what is, what is B2B and B2C? Oh yes, yeah, right. B2B is business to business and B2C is business to consumer. So anything where you're buying personally as a consumer would be considered B2C and anything where you're selling directly to a business. So material bank, for example, we don't sell to consumers. We sell to other businesses, but our businesses potentially sell, you know, when they're selling to an architect or designer that's selling B2C, B2B. But if you're buying a couch from Wayfair, Wayfair is selling to a consumer and that's B2C. Is that clear? Yes, thank you. Great. Okay. So, so one of the things that I thought was really interesting about this slide, so if we know that kind of business to business sales are looking a lot more like the way that you would see a business to consumer sale, what I thought is really interesting here is that when we looked at architects and designers and talked to them, when, like, at least from my perspective, when I look at some of these words that I see here up on this word cloud, I don't know about you, but these are often things that I would associate on a personal level of things that I would want for my personal purchases, not necessarily what I would associate with my professional purchases or my professional decisions. And so what's interesting here, is there anyone else that has a kind of a starkly contrasting opinion? Like when you look at these words, are you thinking, yeah, yeah, I really picture my architect or designer that I work with using these items, using these words to describe their purchases. So all that to say is that even when we're polling and we're talking to architects and designers without people even realizing it, we're already seeing kind of this transfer of our personal habits, our personal buying habits, our personal expectations, our personal kind of ideas about design and comfort translating directly into how we interact on a business level. Um, I don't know about you, but I have found I've been working from home for probably the last 10 years. And I have been, you know, in various positions, always using digital tools, but as a conference line. I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but this year has been the very first time in the last 10 years where there is an absolute expectation and a, a complete shift where all of my meetings are now virtual, but not virtual just on a phone call, but virtual where we're on camera. And for someone that's always worked from home and never had a camera on, like it just wasn't even a concept. It was always, oh, I'm in a conference call. I mean, this for me has been a radical shift that all of a sudden I'm not working from home in my pajamas because now all of a sudden I'm continuously in face-to-face -face meetings in a way that never happened before. Um, 
so that's been on a personal level, really, really interesting just to see how, you know, kind of even digital tools that were being used up until right now have now all of a sudden completely shifted in the way that we even manage those digital tools and the way that we're using them as an interaction tool in a way that we would normally kind of personally interact with someone. So really the big question then for brands here is uh, above all else, uh, you know, you can read some of these ideas here about like, you know, how are we actually creating brand loyalty and how are we kind of coming up with brand strategies where we can use technology and the digital world to really reinforce our brand and the value that we bring to the consumers. But what I am really interested in and what I'd like to kind of, you know, challenge you all with this thought leaving here today is how do you look at using technology not just as this kind of makeshift patch that was required in 2020 or was required to go through COVID. We don't know how long this is going to last, but assuming that things will probably never return to a hundred percent, because once you've had a taste of something and you realize the efficiencies that might be had, you might not go back completely the other way. So how do we all look at using technology to enhance our experiences rather than just being able to like, oh, we can't be in person, so let's just use this as a patch. Um, I think it's a really interesting concept for us to think about so that we can actually think about this as a long-term gain and a long-term goal to really use technology as a way to amplify our service offering rather than just kind of a quick fix, like until COVID is finished. And so, the, so out of that question for me comes like, have we created these efficiencies whereby, you know, you can have top level executive meetings like Marla, I'm guessing that you've probably closed some incredible deals with manufacturers, you know, without even having to go meet them alive where prior to that, that was never even heard of. Um, I, I don't know if anyone has an experience that they want to share or what have you, but I'm, I'm happy to kind of open the floor. Um, but I, 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 will, I will say, I think that it's really pretty incredible, just even from a business development perspective, the way that, and, and, and looking at the trickle down effect that that's probably had, well, that has absolutely had on the environment for, you know, terrible for airlines and terrible for tourism and the travel industry. But on the flip side, you know, this use of technology to connect people coast to coast has had an incredibly positive impact on the environment. So there's, just so many aspects on every end of the spectrum from this crippling businesses to having other businesses explode and all because of our ability to connect or not connect using technology. So this concept of kind of what are the efficiencies that we've created, um, you know, what when we look at digital tools and our ability to resist or embrace them going forward, you know, what can be done virtually now? Like, will that ever go back 100% to not being done virtually? Um, and I speak specifically about a lot of travel that we're doing. Like, I think that certainly, you know, when trade shows come back, there's a, you know, a real longing to be live and kind of having those dialogues because there's so many people that can gather together. Um, but I don't know. I mean, if I have a client meeting in California and I'm in Montreal, I really think I'm going to think twice about the need to go out for one day to have a client meeting where I already know, and it's been proven that we can have a very, very fruitful discussion and build a great collaboration on a zoom call. Um, so it's really interesting kind of, I think, as we start to think about it this way, not, not thinking about technology as this, you know, kind of impediment to our business. And now we can't meet live, but actually how can we look at virtually like, you know, reflect on what has actually been done. Um, what have you accomplished this year that might not have been as easy to accomplish if you weren't using digital tools? And then when we look at, you know, just even our workplace, right? So, you know, 3.4% is a very small number when we talk of the number of people that were working at home, like at least half the time. And when we see that number jumping to over 50% and really looking at the number of jobs and even looking at our own at our own ability to conduct our business from home, you know, like these, these are massive challenges that we're presented to really come up with some critical solutions for, um, you know, and kind of how do businesses look going forward? So I, I, I mean, I find this just incredibly fascinating. Um, and then we, when we look at A and D firms, how does the use of technology and the ability to connect through technology and digital tools, how are we able to look at that and say, okay, well. If 73% of A&D firms said they're probably going to have a lot more flexible remote work policies, what does that mean for manufacturers 
in having no choice but to adopt tools and really enhance them as a way to connect directly with their clients since they're not going to be able to go into their showrooms they're not going to be able to go into their firms in the way that they used to be um so just you know, a tremendous opportunity to really rethink the way that we're doing. And especially now that we're coming into 2021, um, you know, kind of getting out of 2020 and realizing, okay, we don't know how long this is going to be. Let's really come up with some, some pretty exciting, innovative ideas. Um, so, you know, so a lot of this, you know, kind of what I was just speaking to and really understanding, you know, when we talk about sampling, when we talk about presentations and when we look at reps and sales reps, you know, millennials, I'm sure coming up the ladder have no problem with jumping into a Zoom call um, and really leveraging technology as a rep. Like, what does that mean as far as education um, and the way that we can really provide opportunities for an older generation of reps to really get behind the benefit? And how can we, how can we really offer a comfort zone for reps that are really more, um, I, I don't want to use the word old school, but like really have never experienced digital in the way that maybe a younger generation has. So what is the responsibility for us as companies? And even I want to just say like as coming together as a collective, how can we help bring people along to get to the point where this becomes something that's exciting and embraced? Um, you know, and so if we're thinking about virtual as a new norm, um, you know, this has implications across all kinds of, you know, I mean, so we're looking at, you know, physical space, product, physical space implications, product implications, our processes. Um, so this is really just, you know, kind of this idea that going virtual and again, kind of making a decision to embrace rather than resist um, or resist rather than embrace. I mean, it's so multi-layered kind of the number of implications and across so many elements this has. Um, so I, again, like, you know, I mean, I think it's a pretty exciting, it's pretty exciting to think about the opportunities that we have and, you know, how no longer is work just nine to five. And, you know, when, when more than 50% of our work can be done remotely, like, what does that mean as far as the new type of office space that's available? And, and how do we really make an effort when we have in-person meetings to make them incredibly valuable and fruitful and really be the highlight of our week if we're going into the office once a week together? Um, so, and really interesting, like as far as, you know, when we think about, you know, product brainstorming and space brainstorming, what kind of tools are out there to really have fruitful design sessions together to really look at how we can collaborate in a way that, that really makes it exciting and not just as complete hindrance. So we're not going to play again. <laughs> um, I'm just curious, you know, so uh, here it is, we're again in kind of learning and a presentation and a, and a trade show virtually. Are you tired of this? Um, can we get like some interaction for people to give some feedback? You know, yes, get me back or go in with the flow and you're happy to accept. You love this new virtual world. Can, can we get some feedback on where people are at with this? They talk more to balance. Yeah, get, Sorry. get me back. Majority right. want a balance, yeah. Yeah, more of a balance, so that you have a choice. So it's not just imposed; it's all virtual. That's right. But I think that I think that we can probably all agree that you know, I mean, balance is I think probably what we all strive in kind of every aspect of our lives. So why would we strive for that? Why would we be any different in our work life? And I think that if that's a response, that's great. I mean, that means that probably most people here are are willing to embrace. Um, but just if we can have balance and if we can have those personal interactions, you know, that's really what it is. I think that, you know, there's, there's such varying ends of the spectrum, people that never want to go back into the office and feel so excited to be able to be so productive at home. But I think really the balance is ultimately, um, is, is ultimately that tool and how do we strike that balance um, to kind of move forward. And I think that also speaks to, um, you know, how do we actually get to a place where when we are live in person, we can be hyper productive and really efficient together, but not remove the personal and the warm and fuzzy, not feel like, oh, we're only in the office once a week, because that could also present a set of challenges. Like we're only in the office together once a week, we've got so much to get through, but then you end up missing out on that warm and fuzzy kind of connection that you want to have with people. So I think there's a real expectation, I feel, for companies to make sure that it's it can't all be efficiency business all the time when you've got such limited time together. You still need to bring in team building. You need to give opportunities for breaks for people to be able to share a coffee together and just catch up on life. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit here, like 
Um, you know, has there been, does anyone want to share any rewarding aspects of virtual engagement in 2020? Do I have some volunteers to, to kind of share a nice story? Marla, can I put some pressure on you? <laughs> yeah, I, it's funny you're saying, putting faces uh, to, to voices, uh, that, that uh, speaks to me. Also, last week I was on a conference call for the first time in almost... 10 months and it was so frustrating like versus a Microsoft Teams or a Zoom call and I it was because you couldn't figure out who was talking like it's amazing how that used to be the norm forever and now I was just I hung up and I was like I can't do that again I don't think yeah. <laughs> so back to that conference call world it's like this amazing. is more whether your mic whether your camera's on or off it's just a way easier sharing of screens I, I find it very efficient yeah I mean, that's interesting. Like I was, I think I was noting the same thing. That's exactly my experience. I would definitely say for me, it has been incredibly rewarding, um, you know, kind of putting faces to voices rather than just speaking on the phone. It's really something that I didn't really put a lot of stock into it previously. That was just the way life was a lot of conference calls. Um, I hadn't thought about actually, you're right. I mean, just how incredible it is to be sharing screen all the time, but just the, to be able to form such really kind of intimate connections with people on um, kind of face-to-face -face virtual meetings, I find has been just, it has really been rewarding, I have found. I also find it hilarious how the expectation, like the dog barking in the background, like that used to be off, you know, like <laughs> I don't work from home often before COVID, but when I did and that would happen, I'd be mortified. And now yeah. it's just whatever, you know, nobody cares. Like kids are crawling on people's laps and everyone's just in survival mode. So it's kind of, it's kind of, I like the casual side of it as well. Amazing. Yeah. And really allowing kind of a personal aspect to come into business. It was funny yesterday I was on a call and it was, I think it was like five 30 and my son came upstairs and he's 16 and I don't know what he was doing in my office, but someone's like, Oh, it sounds like you have a puppy in the background. I was like, no, that's like my 16 year old son. And yeah. you know, I mean, it can often be a really great icebreaker and, and really, I mean, I think you're right. Like nobody really, cares because everyone understands it like this is just the real world like there's no longer like having to look a per you know like you know maybe we all want to look nice for the camera but at some point like this is life like you may be dealing with 17 different things in the background and then you've just sat down to, to dive into your meeting um yeah it's great does anyone else have anything they'd like to share shamana how about you uh well it calls for a balance definitely because um uh, it, in in our line of work, it looks like it's pretty frustrating when you don't see people face to face, and yeah. uh, and the touch and feel of material and the and and the, and the loss of it, you know, we kind of look at it as an opportunity loss for us as well. So we would rather prefer uh, people touch and feel the material, feel the product, and uh, we we feel that it's much more effective when we are face to face explaining to them rather than do it virtually. You yeah, know, I somehow feel it's not that effective, but then that's reality as of now. That's my experience. Well, and that, that's interesting. And you know, one of the things that I think that we have found is, and I'm going to show you this this video tool that we actually recently launched, speaking directly to that because I think that you want to see your client's reaction when they touch and feel and look at your sample. Like you want to be there to be part of that reaction. Um, so I think that's one of the things that we've heard from a feedback perspective is that that exact sentiment. And so kind of bringing an ability to share samples with your client, but then be able to easily bring them into a virtual call so that it's kind of set up in that way. It's not, you know, kind of odd or awkward, but it's like, hey, let's make an appointment to review your sample box. You'll be receiving it at 1030 tomorrow morning. Let's set up a lunch call um, and you can, you know, take a look at the samples and we can just go through the box together. Um, we found that to be something that we had requests about. Um, and I think it's been able to kind of at least bridge the gap so that you're maybe not there live in person, but at least you can kind of get their reaction and understand because you're at least seeing them while they're looking at your samples. I think most of the time, the frustration also is from the salespeople to be away from the office and, uh, you know, just keep traveling and meeting people rather yeah. than just sitting between four walls or just sitting behind your desk i know oh my it's goodness not what a salesperson does so you know that's where the frustration also comes in I guess. oh yeah being on the road discuss i mean there's so much that comes into being on the road discovering new meals and lunches and doing all kinds of different things it's such an incredible social aspect i see ian gruber keeps trying to say something 
uh, I, I uh, just, just thought it was a great subject. So thanks for bringing it up. But I, I've done, you know, in person lunch and learns. I, I think one month I did 30 at one point in my, you know, I just want to see how many I could do. It wasn't wow. always lunch. It was sometimes beginning. I had an old salesman, an old uh, Marine salesman who put me to task. And he said, you know, why just lunches? Why not do breakfast? Why not do late afternoon? Went, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to book you, pal. And we did. Uh, it, so 30 it, in one month. <laughs> yeah, 31 months. I, I, I won't say I do that regularly. Uh, it's been a while since I've even bothered to try, but I wanted to see if it was possible. That was in person, that was, you know, traveling, ordering, catering, the whole deal. So, you know, it virtually, um, you know, what's interesting is I feel like I have a ton more competition uh, because there's a lot of, you know, a lot of people can throw something together. Yeah. Uh, so I had, to up to, I had to up my game. And I think that's something that uh, this particular circumstances has gives us all opportunities to up our game as far as our, our learning our skills and our our, our our tool building so you know whether it's uh just you know better front lighting you want you know camera that shows the whole frame i actually have a, a green screen i got from amazon you know, crazy demand for a while yeah. uh you know it, finding a piece of software that lets me do uh you know a couple you know a couple different things from full, full presentations to getting me in the screen you know, interacting in different ways, you know, to be able to grab and point and talk. And so it, it's not, it's not terribly complicated in the sense of that, you know, maybe it's a little bit more on the tech side than other things, but yeah. you know, I'm, I'm still in my basement. This is not my background, <laughs> right? It's yeah. my cat can walk across my desk every month in a while. So, I, but, you know, but I, I think that there's a, and, and there's other reps in the company that I work with in junior assemblies that I've been really encouraging just to add little levels of your game. You know, so one guy, our presenter, is just amazing voice, great presenter. And he just, he's missing a little bit of front lighting. So I'm going to ship him some front lighting. You know, just small amazing. little things that you yeah. can do so you can have that more human interaction. But to answer your original question, do I miss the in-person? Well, it's not, it's not the presentation I miss. Uh, although there's a nice high being in front of like 20 people, you can get the same thing virtual. Yeah. But I miss, I miss before the meeting, after the meeting, Right, I miss the lunches afterwards. I take somebody out for like it's all those little things that you create a relationship with. So yeah. a lot of my relationships that are now virtual, they're a little bit more brief than the ones yeah. I've had for twenty years in, in sales. You know, those guys are you know, there's a whole different conversation level I have with those people than the people I, I'm meeting this way. Yeah. Um, you know, even though people are more comfortable with it, especially the young ones. But I don't want to take too much time. But I just wanted to share that. So. No, that's amazing. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to share. That's that's terrific. And you know, I like what you talked about. You know that you're you're there, kind of brainstorming with colleagues to kind of see their strength and kind of see how you can help them. Because I think that, I mean, that's that's wonderful, and I think you should feel really great about that. That to me would be a real highlight of kind of this virtual experience. Because you know, it's like if you're embracing it for yourself, how can you bring other people along the way to embrace it and really help them have success in it? Um, so that, that's terrific feedback. Thanks a lot for sharing. Um, so I'm a little bit nervous to, to kind of jump into another screen because I wasn't able to share with you, but I, what I wanted to talk about here was, you know, kind of like different ways, whether it's backlighting or, or different technologies, you know, that you're bringing into your presentations to make it just feel a little bit more, more real kind of this. I don't know, have, have many of you used Jamboards? No. No? Maybe something similar to it. Can you describe it? Yeah. So a Jamboard, and I mean, I, at the end of my presentation, maybe I'll just jump on and show you, but a Jamboard is basically, it's this idea where it's like, it's a, it's like an interactive board where everyone can be sharing the screen and put sticky notes and you can put up a topic and it's like, you're able to do a virtual session where it doesn't have to be one moderator taking notes, but everybody can actually, um, everybody's actually able to contribute to this one board and all of their ideas. And it can really just, we use this in a lot of our working groups. Um, with a group called Mindful Materials that I'm with, but it's, it turns out to be a fantastic opportunity to be able to interactively um, work and engage everyone. So it's not just people speaking if they're inspired to, and then someone else taking notes, but everyone's actually adding their own comments directly to the board. So if anyone doesn't know about this, I would, you know, this is, you know, kind of used, so it's, it's a free tool by Google, this uh, Google suite. Um, so I'd urge you guys to check it out. I, I had one kind of prepared for this, but I'm a little gun shy now. So I am embracing technology, but I'm a little bit nervous about jumping to it in this presentation. Um, so my, my closing thoughts here, I think are really just like, 
what if we all for a day or for a week or for however long we just said, let's forget about fear. Let's forget about all the things that kind of paralyze us from wanting to move forward, that we're not sure if this is going to be just right. That, I mean, if I had if I had let fear kind of drive this presentation, I never would have even dreamt about using Kahoot. And I never would have thought about coming up with questions where we could engage like this because I would have done more of a formal presentation. So while this kind of went a little bit haywire from a technology perspective, I'm happy that I kind of wasn't paralyzed by the fear of technology. And I took the plunge and took the challenge. And, you know, if you remember anything from this, you might be like, oh yeah, that woman that had the presentation that she couldn't get back to her presentation. Um, so I think it's, I mean, I think it's nice to, to be in a situation where we can challenge ourselves and say, you know, how do we disrupt ourselves? How do we disrupt our business, our industry, our own personal habits and really move ahead and innovate and really get to a point where we see a beauty in kind of this next level of, um, of using technology to help advance us and just advance the world. Um, so this concept, like, you know, things are not going away. Libraries were already in decline. Um, architecture and design libraries were already going digital in large part before COVID hit. Um, you know, when we look at our members, um, you know, kind of this group that we're able to pull when we're getting like seven or eight responses, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that talk about things not going back to the way that they were. Um, again, kind of working with our partner Think Lab, you know, it's going to take a while before trade shows get back to where they used to be, like halls busy like this with no mask wearing. Like this is a real thing of the past and we don't even know what this is going to look like. Is it going to be two, three, four years before, you know, we can really get back into this kind of situation? I have no idea. Maybe it's next year, but the point is, is that it's uncertain and we just don't know. Um, and one of the things that's actually been really great to hear and give feedback to our brands is that again, kind of going back to this concept that it's not necessarily from what we see the architects and designers that are having an issue with change and kind of embracing technology. If anything, they're excited to discover newness and have new experiences on the technology side, especially if it's going to streamline their workflow. And so we're talking about like 80% of our members talking that it's easier to discover new brands on the platform. Um, and this is something I thought was cool to show you, like as part of our platform um, that's available to both our brands and all of our members is bringing to light kind of these di digital palettes. So Marla, this would speak to you because there's some terrazzo in here. So if I'm a rep, if I'm a, if I'm a man, uh, an architect or designer, I can create a board like this and share it with my client. So share it with Facebook if they're my client working on this next project, or if I'm a rep, in this case, this is a mock-up with Charquette. Imagine that this is you as a rep and take a listen. Hey Jen, here are some options for your Building 12 cafe renovation. I've included some budget items that I think work well with your existing finishes. I've also included a recent photo for reference. So take a look and then let's reconnect. <laughs> so I think that's pretty cool. Um, so this is, this. pardon? Rebecca, you got five minutes. Okay, so this is a really neat way to be able to say like, you know, hey, like, you know, one of our sales reps like fully got into it and was kind of figuring out how we could make videos as sales follow up by using our platform and kind of showcasing like similar brands and what have you. But, you know, kind of being able to use tools like this in a way that, you know, we never thought possible. Like, can you imagine following up with a client after a meeting and sharing a video with them of the samples that you just sent to them? Um, like, there's a lot of really great opportunities. And I mean, I'm a little bit biased. I love this program that we built. Um, because it's obviously within our platform. And I mean, the feedback has been tremendous, but just to show you just kind of the depths that you can go to using virtual tools. Um, and then again, like as we look at from an architectural and design side of things, just how much adoption there is, like these are massive numbers. And if not, I would say probably a hundred percent, this happens to be our impact within firms, but I would say there's probably not a firm out there that is not using digital tools as part of their daily workflow. This is just a small list of some of the groups that are using Material Bank to source and sample materials because they want everything now and they want to review materials and samples with their rep, with the architect that they're working on a project with and with their own internal design team. So this is really pervasive across every level of design using technology as, as a tool to streamline and advance workflow. Um, you know, whether it's like robots involved in kind of sampling distribution, um, a big thing I spoke about at the beginning was this idea of collaborating. So again, kind of making it easier for people to embrace technology if there's numerous pieces of technology that they can find in a single location. 
So we're working really hard on that, like working with mindful materials from a sustainability perspective, BIM object with modeling, uh, AEC daily from an education perspective and being able to bring all that involved in the search materials, sam material, sample materials, but also be able to have access to CEUs and modeling downloads. Um, so I'm gonna leave you with the idea that I, I really believe that kind of this future that's still very much unknown to all of us is a heck of a lot less scary when if we know that this is already the direction that we were heading in on that we just like jump on the horse and really embrace kind of whatever the future is going to bring us and start looking at the tools that we're using now as a way to help bring forward our opportunities rather than holding us back um so kind of this idea where you know perspectives really get smaller out of fear and when we are fearful we don't really see this huge mountain of opportunities in front of us and when we really take time to plan that's where we're really driving through innovation. And if we really want to be out there on the front line and disrupt, um, that's really from deciding to take risks, whether they're measure, measured or kind of wild and careless. Um, I, I really encourage all of you to kind of go out in your personal and your work lives and use digital tools as a way to uh, create tremendous success, let go of fears and really drive innovation. Thank you, Rebecca. I think we are uh, running out of time. I'm done. Thanks. 3.30 thank, on the nose. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. Uh, thank you to DRE Industries for sponsoring this event. Uh, please, uh, to the other attendees, please move back to the main stage for a couple of announcements and please take a few minutes between seminars. Uh, I'd like to, to ask a question. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yep. uh, Rebecca, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with this uh, material bank. Are you replacing all the on-site uh, product representatives now, or why don't I just go to Tennessee and get all the help I need virtually or by way of Amazon getting products? How so, does that work? Yeah, so we work directly with the reps every time someone orders a sample the next day by 7.30 in the morning before your sample has even arrived at your client's desk you know exactly who's ordered it, what sample they ordered, the SKU number, what stage of the project it's at, what project details are, are requested for that sample. And the reps get that in their hands like a hot lead and they're able to follow up directly with that client. So all we do is facilitate the lead generation for the brands and the brands take those leads and, and, and follow up on them as if they would have sent the sample themselves. How effective is this when you're in Tennessee? Um, from, from what vantage point? Um, from a relationship building point of view, uh, uh, not knowing who's going to show up uh, at my virtual uh, studio. Uh, so huh? all of this, all the way that Material Bank works is it's really what happens in Tennessee is our distribution hub. All of our brands ship their sample inventory to our distribution hub. The platform yeah, has uh, no... Pardon? Uh, sorry, sorry, Rebecca. I, uh, I think we're really running out of time. Oh, maybe, sure. Okay, sorry about that. Maybe you can uh, sorry, connect no. with the customer on the on the chat on on the on the feed loop page. I'm uh, really getting. Uh, I'm uh, really sorry. We're really out of time. Okay. So all attendees, please move on to the main stage. Our next seminar will start at 3:45, and I hope to see you at the social later. Thank you very much. <laughs>